Welcome to this episode of Mission Business, a podcast about good business for those in the business of good, presented by your part-time controller, LLC, also known as YPTC. My name is Jennifer Oliva, the host of Mission Business and managing partner at YPTC. On this episode of Mission Business, I spoke with Mary Beth Brueggemann, president of The Mission Continues and Marine Veteran. The Mission Continues is a national nonprofit that empowers veterans to continue their service at home in their communities. In our conversation, we discuss Mary Beth's experiences as a Marine veteran, the Mission Continues programs, as well as how Mary Beth is working to maximize women veterans' success as leaders. We talk about a lot in this episode, and to learn more about The Mission Continues and their programs, please visit themissioncontinues.org. And now, my conversation with Mary Beth Brueggemann. Mary Beth, thank you so much for joining us on the Mission Business Podcast. It's great to have you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. So before we dive into the mission of The Mission Continues, let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, You're a veteran yourself. Um, Tell us about your background and how you came to Mission Continues. Sure. Uh, Well, I have to start from the start. I am the daughter of two Peace Corps, returned Peace Corps volunteers who met in the Peace Corps. So um, I don't know that my parents envisioned me going into the Marine Corps as an adult, but service was definitely in my family and in my blood from the very start. So hearing their stories of service and how they committed their lives Um, their early lives to the Peace Corps and then to teaching English for a very long time during my childhood. Uh, I grew up around that. Uh, We lived overseas in uh, Saudi Arabia for five and a half years when I was young. And those were also very formative years for me where we were part of a a strong, connected expat community that, um, you know, was very patriotic. And uh, it was a we were there in the mid 80s, mid to late 80s. When we came home, it was just before Desert Storm, uh, the Gulf War. So that, again, coming from thinking about the trajectory of my young childhood and what I had already been ingrained with, and then as a young person um, watching that war start and end, and that was probably the first time I can really remember feeling like I really wanted to be a part of something in service to my country. So what was the next step? Is that when you decided you were going to go into the military yourself? And how did you decide uh, where in what branch of the military you were going to serve? Uh, Some of that was decided for me to a degree, but I was very impressionable when I was very close with a great uncle of mine. And my uncle Paul graduated from the Naval Academy with the class of 1945. And he graduated in 1944, a year early to go join World War II. Um, It was the year that they accelerated their graduations. Uh, And he was a really big part of my life. He was like a grandfather to me growing up. We lived in Northern Virginia, and the Naval Academy is about an hour away from my childhood home. Um, So he he took me and my family to a Navy Air Force football game one year. And there's so much pageantry in a service academy football game, especially when it's between two service academies. It's a really big deal. And Uh I just loved it. I mean, I watched the midshipmen march onto the field in their uniforms, and they were just part of this really tight-knit team, this group. They They were part of something. And again, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but like really feeling like I was starting to understand what I wanted to be a part of and and what it what I wanted to dedicate my life to in service to my country. That was a moment when I remember just looking at the field and saying, yeah, I'm going there. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And I applied to both the Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy and got into both and had a very hard decision to make uh, and ultimately decided on the Naval Academy. I'm glad I did. And from there, I had uh, a choice to pursue the Navy as a service choice or the Marine Corps. Um, much smaller group goes into the Marine Corps from the Naval Academy. Um, at the time, it was congressionally mm-hmm. mandated at 16 and two thirds percent of the class could select. So it was pretty small selection group. Um, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. So it was it was the I have a tendency to pick the harder path, the thing that looks more challenging to me. And that's what that the Marine is, Corps was. That is challenging. And I'm curious uh, how many women were in your graduating class as Marines? 
Oh, as Marines, I don't know, really small. Yeah. There were 12% yeah. women about in my class overall, in a class of about okay. um, um, almost 900. We were just under 900. Um, yeah. And a very small percentage went into the Marine Corps. There, the Marine Corps is was then and, and is still made up of about 8% women. Um, so, you know, we were probably pretty representative of that percentage. I, I was, yeah. you know, if I fast forward a little bit, I was almost always the only woman in the room as an active duty Marine. After the Naval Academy, uh, where, where did you go? Well, first to train. So all Marines, mm -hmm. all Marine officers train in the same way. We go to for six months down to the, the um, beautiful woodlands of, of Quantico, Virginia, uh, mm -hmm. to learn the fundamentals and the basics of being a Marine officer. And from there, I, um, I was selected to be a combat engineer. So that was my specialty as an officer. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the school for three months to learn the particulars of that, of that specialty, some, um, some technical pieces of it. And then again, just a little more understanding of what the Marines, who the Marines would be and what they would be able to do, what their skill sets would be that I'd be leading. And then off to what we call the fleet. So off to my first duty station in Miramar, California. Um, to lead a platoon of Marines. Were you ever deployed? I was. Um, so I got to my first unit in 2000. And uh, it was about all told, with all my training done, it was almost a year of training until I, I checked into my first unit in Miramar. And I was a platoon commander there for a combat engineer platoon. Um, and I was a platoon commander for a year and a half or so, and then um, promoted into a company commander job. And from there, so leading a larger group of Marines who had different specialties, combat engineers, it was I was leading a group that all had the same, all had the same skill set. Um, this was multiple different, different functions and groups within the company. And from there, um, we deployed as a as a whole unit to first Kuwait in um, we left in January of 2003, I think. Um, and then sat on the border between Kuwait and Iraq in early March, and then crossed the border on the first day of the invasion um, into Iraq in March of 2003. So we were one of the first Marine units across the border and furthest north of any Marine unit for a short time until folks overtook us. We stayed in place in the south part of Iraq, um, and then other units kind of leapfrogged north towards Baghdad. But it was uh, mm. Those first couple weeks, especially of the Iraq war were, um, it was a lot. It was very intense. It was like, without the, w without being too flippant about it, it was like the Super Bowl. I mean, we'd, we would been training for this moment yeah. for these days for our whole careers. And some of those mm -hmm. very long and some for me, it was relatively short. Um, yeah. and then it was there, it was time to perform. And it was, yeah. it was when all the muscle memory and all the training kicked in. And, and fortunately we had a very successful deployment. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, you should be. Um, were there any events, um, uh, in the Iraqi war, uh, that really made an impression on you that really, um, that you remember very well and, uh, are important to you, your story? Yes. And I'm going to take this in a direction you may not be expecting, but I met my husband during that deployment. Mm, I did <laughs> so, not expect that. <laughs> I know. Um, and of course, I, I mean, I, I could go on and on about the professional learnings, but you asked the question in a certain As? way that I, I can really only answer it in one way. And the most mm -hmm. memorable piece of that deployment for me was that um, he and I met during that time. And I'll say this just kind of, again, to kind of take it on a relationship journey a little bit here. The sure. fact that I met my husband, who was a Marine and, and retired after 23 years in the Marine Corps, very type A, very, very much a Marine's Marine, um, and a, a, you know, dominant male, like all the things you think of as a Marine in all the yeah. best ways. The fact mm -hmm. that he met me when I was, he was a pilot and I was leading, I was the officer in charge of the airfield where he landed. And I had, I was in a position of authority and I was doing my job in at the best, probably again, the most intense moment of my whole life I was doing this job. Yes. That's when my husband met me and immediately fell in love with me. I he yeah. and I can't help but come back to those moments of uh, especially for me as a woman, recognizing I'm yes. in this marriage that um in so many ways could be balanced in a different way. But I yes. I it's wonderful me for me to reflect back on the fact that he saw me physically at my absolute worst. I mean, I hadn't showered in weeks. <laughs> I was wearing chemical protective gear that covered up almost yeah. my whole body. But 
Yeah. Um, but still, that's those are the things he comes I mean, back to is that was when you were at your best. And I love that. That is a beautiful story. I actually have goosebumps because <laughs> I did not expect that question to go in that direction. And uh, the fact that you're fully covered, you you have, um, uh, you really, you're not, you're showing your full true self in that leadership role and as a woman, and he sees that strength. I, I think that's just a beautiful story. You stayed in the military until when? Um, that was at year four of my Marine Corps career, and I was in for a total of eight uh -huh. years. So it was a relatively short time, again, in the span of life. I left active duty in 2007. Um, uh -huh. So yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty intense little short stint. And then after that, wh where did you go? I left, um, so I redeployed from my rack home back to my mm -hmm. duty station in California and went through the whole, you know, coming home from deployment reintegration piece of that that was interesting. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. almost immediately, I was transferred to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, um, where I spent the next almost four years, uh, first as a, an instructor and uh, in a leadership position, leading and coaching um, midshipmen through their journey. And then um, moved into a position as the deputy sexual assault response coordinator for the last year of my time there and my last year on active duty. And then transitioned off of active duty into the civilian world in, in uh, 2007. I would like to talk to you a little bit about your experiences teaching at the Naval Academy and your um, experience on the sexual assault team. Mm -hmm. I, I've read and, and uh, I, I noted that you really helped make a cultural shift as it relates to women or uh, sexual assault at the Naval Academy and maybe in the military in general? Well, for the for the former, I, I've worked really hard. And I, I don't think I knew that I was doing it, frankly, with, mm -hmm. with respect to changing people's ideas about women. I wasn't um, yeah. approaching that job as a, you know, I'm a, thinking of myself as a woman leader who needed to make an impression. But mm -hmm. I think I did through the course of being one of the only women on uh, one of the only women Marines on the staff. And at the time, because of the timing, 2003, I was the only woman on the staff in the Naval Academy, like day to day interaction with the midshipmen who had been to Iraq. So I had, quote unquote, combat experience. And that gave me a certain level of um, I'm sure. respect and gravitas that I that I mm -hmm. um, was glad to have being back in the hall with the midshipmen, but also that allowed me and, and put me in a position where I could express myself as a woman in a in a different way. And I was allowed into rooms and given access to the midshipmen mm -hmm. to coach and teach them in a way that, again, put a woman leader in front of them where they otherwise had not seen women lead in this way. And they just didn't have a lot of access to women leaders who were out on active duty. So I took advantage of that and I have for my whole life. And I'd, I haven't always in the moment appreciated the position that I'm in and, and the amount of influence that I can have in that time. But, um, you know, from from early days of recognizing that, you know, I'm, I'm the only woman here and that mm -hmm. is hurting me. That's hard to grow as a leader in that way. So mm -hmm. wanting to show up in the lives of other women as much as possible and and um, be an example for them, be an ear for them, be somebody who is empathetic to the very particular and unique struggles that women have, not only while they're on active duty, but when they transition. Um, and, you know, we'll, we can talk about that more as we get into the sure. mission continues. But that yes. part of my military service, the part that is unique to me being a woman, uh, very much has informed so much of how I lead at the Mission Continues and so much of the work that we do at the Mission Continues as well. That's why it resonates so strongly with me. After you taught at the Naval Academy, I guess you, you went out to civilian world. Um, and then what took you from that part of your life to the Mission Continues, which I think you started around 2015? I did. Yeah, I, that yeah. was when I joined the team, right? Um, mm -hmm. A little bit of a winding road, honestly, like so mm -hmm. many of us have. I I left active duty because I had my first daughter. And I have three kids now, girl, boy, uh -huh. girl. And mm -hmm. I was pregnant with my daughter. I had my daughter while on active duty. And um, I had to make a decision in her first year. It was time for Brian, my husband, and I to move and for, for us to pick a new duty station. And for me to decide, am I going to go back into this full bore uh, Marine Corps as another, as a company mm -hmm. commander again, and have to assume I was going to deploy immediately. 
That was in mm-hmm. 2007. It was at the height of uh, operational tempo for Marines. They were deploying constantly, mm-hmm. as we would find mm-hmm. out with my husband as he stayed in. Wow. And we had to make a family decision, and I had to make a decision. Am I going to be able to be the kind of mom I want to be and I envision being, and also mm-hmm. the kind of Marine that I only know how to be? And I decided I could not. I did not think I could do both as well as I needed Mm -hmm. to be able to do both. Um, Mm -hmm. So I made the decision to transition. I never looked back. It was not an easy decision, but I never looked back. I never regretted making that decision, not for a minute. But it definitely created some really interesting voids for me. Um, Mm -hmm. I've described many times that the feeling of taking my uniform off for the last time. And Mm. I can look back on those moments and those days and remember it feeling like I was taking off my uniform and folding it up and putting it on a shelf in my closet right next to my purpose. (laughs) And they were just gone all at once. And it was just, it was instantaneous. I mean, it was the you you unbutton, remove the camouflage utilities, and it, oh, you're just gosh. done. And yeah. I had served my country for 12 years, if you count the time I spent at the Naval Academy. Mm-hmm. And d- I really didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know what to do with that void. And that was yeah. true for a, a long time. And and keep in mind, I'm a, I'm a mom at this point. It's not that I didn't yeah. have... Um, wonderful blessings in my life. I was, yeah. I was, I had so many gifts and I knew that. Mm-hmm. I had a full-time job that I, that I loved and appreciated. They were flexible and wonderful. It was a great transition job. Um, but there was always something missing. And I poured mm-hmm. myself into some kinds of volunteering. I, I coached yeah. for, you know, running clubs for young girls. And I taught English as a second language in my time. And I volunteered on base for my husband's unit. Yeah. But there was always just this this feeling that I had I had learned so much and I had all this experience and I just I didn't know where to point it next to make the mm-hmm. biggest impact. I just felt like I was I was not living up to my potential. Mm-hmm. Um, and then again through a winding road of leaving the workforce entirely and as a mom just following my husband and supporting his career for a time which had its own challenges and I you know I, being a stay at home mom has a set mm-hmm. of challenges. But dropping mm-hmm. out of the workforce as someone who's always been driven and ambitious was very yeah. difficult. Yes. Um, on ramping back into the workforce and and uh, finding things to do in the meantime. But in 2015, yes. I <clears throat> just had a serendipitous meeting with a woman who is wonderful and has been a coach and a mentor to me and is on our board at The Mission Continues. And she introduced me to the organization, and there happened to be a, a open role that was a great fit for my skill set, and someone took a chance on me, and here I am. Your story is similar to many women. I can totally relate. I can't relate to the military side of things, but I can totally relate to um, leaving a bigger job and then um, having children and trying to figure out what's next. And yeah. uh, absolutely. And that's when I found your part-time controller actually in that uh, in that change. So, uh, you know, that, and, and that story, yeah. I have to say that story resonates with so many women. Yeah. yeah, It really does. It doesn't matter what the backdrop of your story is, whether it was a desert like mine or, um, yeah. or any a corporate job or school yeah. or whatever it was. Like we, there is this common experience for women yes. who try to have this balance. It's not easy. Yes. Yeah. Not uh, trying to have it all actually, or not having it all at the same time, but understanding yeah. that you could be a mom and also have fulfill an, um, an incredible purpose mm-hmm. uh, in your, in your soul and in, in your life. So uh, I'm glad that you found that. Me too. <laughs> Hi everyone. Thanks for listening to Mission Business Podcast. My name is Carol Melvin, and I'm a senior manager and leader in YPTC's Washington, D.C. office. YPTC is currently hiring nationwide. We offer a flexible work environment, 35-hour standard work week, perks and incentives, full benefits, as well as full and part-time positions to fit your needs. The best part? You can use your accounting skills for good and directly impact the success of amazing nonprofit organizations. At YPTC, we know that a career is not one size fits all. We are dedicated to a workplace guided by trust, support, education, integrity, equity, community, and strong relationships. YPTC is consistently recognized for its strong and employee-focused culture. 
Most recently, we appeared on Inc. Magazine's Best Places to Work list and ranked second in Accounting Today's Best Accounting Firms to Work For. So what's next? Are you ready to love your job? Apply today on YPTC.com or contact careers at YPTC.com. We can't wait to meet you. Mary Beth, how did your experience in the military prepare you to be a nonprofit executive director? Well, I think it's a two part answer. You know, one, preparing to lead a company. And so I I gained a lot of skills in the military that prepared me for this kind of leadership, this this level of leadership role. Some of them were very practical. We have a lot of mm-hmm frameworks and um, acronyms that we use in the military that help to structure decision making in a timely, efficient and effective way. And not only do I appreciate the frameworks and the structure now, because I go back to them all the time. I mean, my brain is just wired that way now. But I also appreciate that the purpose of those structures was to get to a decision. And that In the military, Mm. one of the just fundamentally one of the cultural pieces of the military that you that you learn very early on as a leader is that any decision is better than no decision. So Mm. move it along and get to a decision. So here's a framework to help you do that. So I've got a lot of kind of tools in my own toolkit that I learned from the Marine Corps that I, I carry through and remember and call back all the time in my daily life. Nonprofit leadership is 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 also its own little brand of challenge and you know my mission focus and team focus in the military i think is probably what set me up best or or makes me somebody who is a, a good fit for nonprofit leadership because i am so hyper focused on service to others i'm so hyper focused on being part of something that's bigger to my bigger than myself mm-hmm. i'm hyper focused on something that is really mission focused and service driven and you know surrounding myself with people who are like minded in that sense that put service above self let's talk a little bit about um the mission continues and uh the mission of the mission continues tell us about that Sure. Um, I love talking about this, obviously, because this is where I this is where I figured it all out. You know, as my story comes to this crescendo personally of, you know, how do I take my all this potential and this experience I have and 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 bring it to life and repurpose all those skills here at home? That's what we do at The Mission Continues. So we help veterans and empower them to uh, continue their service and their leadership right here at home in under-resourced communities. We're taking the problem of veterans who um, sometimes feel a real lack of purpose and direction in their post-military life, and we're marrying that with the problems we have at home in communities that lack the resources mm. that they need to thrive and sometimes the leadership that they need to thrive. We're putting those two problems together to create a really really wonderful, you know, double double bottom line of impact kind of solution in communities through veteran leadership. So almost your story, you know, others, yeah. uh, other veterans looking for purpose and you're helping them find their purpose in the work they do at The Mission Continues. Tell me a little bit about your programs. Yeah, well, so the way we're structured, um, we put this work to life through what we call our service platoon. So it's meant mm-hmm. to have a familiar uh, sounding name to the veterans that are out there and to connect non-veterans to our the pieces of our veteran culture that we're so proud of, the connectedness, the team. The service platoons are groups, teams of um, veterans, non-veterans, family members, supporters. There is community members. There's no barrier to entry of our service platoons. Anybody can be a part of them. They're Mm -hmm. led by military veterans and teams of military veterans who are, again, finding a way to repurpose their skill set and experience to do the most good in the communities that need the most. So that's a that's a place where we can and and a framework and a structure where we can activate ultimately hundreds of thousands of volunteers on the ground. Um, If there's an opportunity, we're not at that scale now, but that's that's the possibility that's out there. With that, we recognize that the veterans who lead in those platoons and those that serve with us in any capacity, they're also looking for additional skills and they're looking for tools to put in their tool toolkit that can help them be as successful as possible in their civilian lives mm-hmm. and in their as they lead in their communities in whatever capacity they choose to lead. So our leadership development programs help to answer mm-hmm. that, answer that um that challenge and fill that void. We 
We have a program called our Service Leadership Corps that helps prepare people for community-based leadership. And Mm -hmm. we have a program called our Women Veterans Leadership Program that um, specifically pulls women aside and helps them address some of those unique challenges that I talked about earlier and some of the opportunities and the strengths that women have in a in a gender segregated program that is um amazing for helping to connect them and put them in a in a safe place where they can talk about those challenges in a way that they mm-hmm. probably never have before so we're our platoons are active in more than 40 cities so most major metropolitan areas you can find us um and they're active year round they they mostly do service projects on weekends when they have availability and they've got community partners that are are ready to receive I hope all your listeners will go to the website (laughs) and find a way to get involved and join their local service platoon. Hopefully there'll be one in most of your areas. So the platoons are led by military, but you don't have to be a military or veteran to join a platoon. That's right. Yep. That's the premise. That's the model is that we're bringing veterans and non-veterans together in service um, and helping to expose everybody in that spectrum to veteran leadership and Um, A recognition that we have so many challenges in this country, uh, and whether it's in your workplace or in your schools or on your school board or in your own community, um, asking a veteran to lead not only helps you solve the challenge because you're going to have access to an incredible amount of talent, Mm -hmm. but it also helps the veteran because it's we need it uh, more than anything. Yeah. I wanted to talk about how the veterans get involved in the leadership program. Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk a little bit about really how it does help them in, in their own lives. Sure. Um, Well, our leadership programs have an application, so they're all uh, listed on our website. And uh, many of them come to our, find our applications just through social media or, you know, it's advertised or a friend tells us, tells them about it. And some of them come to us after experiencing that same void I talked about earlier, where they've really missed their purpose. Um, They've, they've can't find their passion again. They can't Mm -hmm. figure out how to apply their skill set. We're the first opportunity for many of these veterans that um, imagine some of them have actually told us, you know, I was on the couch before this. I wasn't leaving mm-hmm. my home. I was close to making some very permanent choices in my life. And and then I found the mission continues and I'm on a totally different path. And I do love the combination of uh, veterans and civilians working together. Yeah. I think it elevates uh, the understanding of the civilians working with the veterans about their experiences. Have yeah. you heard any stories about that or anything interesting to share? Yes, and I'll say this, it goes both ways. So I think mm. that our service projects provide an opportunity for bridge building, but it mm. isn't about building the bridge and then inviting others, right. inviting non-veterans to cross the bridge to understand veterans better. It truly is about building the bridge and then moving everybody to the middle of it um, it. and, and meeting it. right there. So mm-hmm. veterans gain as much from exposure to non-veterans and Mm -hmm. this culture and community that they may have been able to shelter themselves from through their whole military career by staying on base or having a Rolodex full of, or an iPhone now, full of um, (laughs) all friends who are veterans and they don't have to leave that, the comfort of their known culture. Mm -hmm. They benefit as much from getting out of that box as the non-veterans benefit from the exposure to veterans and their culture. And again, their experience their we have an ability to demystify both. Um, yeah. On the veteran side, you know, Hollywood, uh, in some ways does us a great service. How many in my generation joined because of Top Gun? <laughs> <laughs> Hands raised all over the country, mine and my husband's included. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. And that's great. But it also, um, it, it also makes it it also presents a certain view of the military that's absolutely not totally accurate. It's mm-hmm. not comprehensive. Um, right. It's It for sure presents a, a very particular picture of what a veteran mm-hmm. looks like in their life mm-hmm. that is not yeah. inclusive of what I look like, for example. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think it's, a, again, it's a double-edged or two sides of the same coin, and the benefit goes flows both ways. How many uh, volunteers do you have in a particular year that uh, help you fulfill the mission? Um, well, at our best and at our highest strength, which was pre-COVID, I have to say, mm-hmm. um, we're, we're creeping up around 25,000 volunteers in a year. Wow. Um, our model, again, is built so that we we have the ability to activate hundreds of thousands. So we're, we're nowhere mm-hmm. close to having hit our reached our potential as an organization. Yeah. Um, 
COVID's tough. You know, people are not volunteering in the same numbers that they were. They're just starting to come back to being in person. We've been active throughout COVID. We've had more than 800 service projects over the last two years in person um, Mm -hmm. with social distancing and local guidelines in place. We've found ways to continue to um, empower veterans to serve, and we've Mm -hmm. done it safely. Are there other programs that we haven't touched upon that you'd like to, to mention or bring up? So we do have a uh, brand new program offering that we are uh, piloting in April of this year of 2022. And it's uh, colloquially right now called inclusive leadership. That's topical. I don't know that that will Mm -hmm. be the name of the program, Mm -hmm. Um, but that's what it is. And it's this again is for veterans and it's for veterans who are looking to gain some additional skills uh, in order to bring together diverse teams, which we have Mm -hmm. at the mission continues. We're really fortunate that we are, we attract a really incredibly diverse network of veterans and non-veterans. But we also recognize that it requires an additional skill set that most of us do not have, and certainly we do not learn in the military, that allows us to take a diverse team and help everybody, every single person that's on that team feel a sense of belonging and inclusion, and that their skill set and the unique contributions that they have and the very fact that they are a woman, the very fact that they are a person of color or the very fact that they identify as LGBTQ or they come Mm -hmm. from a rural community or Mm -hmm. a big city. Those are, those are things that, um, that we all have to do a little bit of additional learning to understand how to integrate that into a highly functioning team. So this program is a, a, a will be a very intensive um, workshop type experience, three days in person um, opportunity for particularly we recognize the potential that veterans have to be these bridge builders and to bring people together and to assemble diverse teams and make the most of that opportunity you have when you bring people around you from different backgrounds. Very excited about that one. I wanted to get back to the uh, women that work and volunteer at the Uh, mission continues. I I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a significant number of women that do um, uh, volunteer for uh, leadership positions. Of course, you have the the women uh, leadership program that you have, uh, but there's a significant number of volunteers as well. Why do you think that is? And how does that help? How does your, how do your programs, other than the leadership, you know, the volunteerism help women veterans in particular? Well, we asked that question, why Why is that? You know, when looking around mm-hmm. in our network about, um, about nine or 10 years ago now, we observed that the veterans that were coming to the mission continues and seeking out additional leadership opportunities, almost 40% of them were women. Wow. Um, for context, about 11% of the milita- of the veteran population, sorry, is women. They are yeah. the fastest growing demographic within the veteran population, but still very, very small. Yeah. So 40% was very surprising and um, exciting for us as an organization. Yeah. And so we had to ask some questions about that. Mm-hmm. So we surveyed the women in our network and we asked them, why what is it that's attracting you to the mission continues? And what do you need from us and from other organizations in order to be successful? And what we heard from them resulted in our very first Women Veterans Leadership Summit. So not yet a program, but a a three-day weekend, um, you know, opportunity, almost like a retreat with a lot of skill building. So we did four, you know, four annual summits. And throughout that time, the one thing that was that was lingering for us, the one, you know, emotion that kept pulling us back was we don't, this just isn't enough. We Mm -hmm. had 300, 350 applicants for every single one of those summits. We were accepting about 75 women to join us. So it it couldn't, we couldn't get to the number of women we wanted to get to. Okay. And every time we left them after three days, we thought, oh, it's like we're just dropping them off a cliff now. Like we can't, we need, they need more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They need Mm -hmm. something more Mm -hmm. sustained from us. They need skills. They need to continue to build and practice these skills. And we want to help. So in 2020, we launched our first cohort of our Women Veterans Leadership Program. So finding the support for that, the funding for that, the resources to turn that summit into a program, um, that's just been a a very proud accomplishment of our team over the last couple of years. 
And this program has turned into something really spectacular and incredibly unique, we think, in yeah. the veteran space. And we hear that we that's validated for us time and time again, mm -hmm. um, that nobody's doing anything quite like this. And it's a program that is built for women who want to increase their leadership skills. It's applicable to women, whether they are veterans or non-veterans, but it's special that we have a group of veterans in the room together because we can address, again, the backdrop of their experience in a very unique and specific way. I want to get into the business of The Mission Continues. This podcast is called Mission Business. So we yeah. talk a little bit about um, your funding sources and other things related to the business of uh, your organization. I understand that the vast majority of your funding comes from corporate sponsorships, which is um, to the nonprofits listening is going to be like, oh, that's interesting because that's that's a tough area to get in. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, we have a blend of um, the majority of our funding comes from corporations and foundations. So mm -hmm. very different funding sources, but both private, both philanthropy, both philanthropy. Small portion comes from individual donors, um, something we're trying to grow over time. We're working very hard to grow our donor base. Um, tiny, we have a very relatively, I should say, small grant from the government, um, but we don't get a lot of, we don't get significant government funding. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's a it's an interesting mix and corporations and foundations both come with their, um, their amazing contributions, uh, not just financial contributions, but their thought leadership contributions, their brand recognition that that serves the mission continues in so many positive ways um, and challenges. You know, it's yeah. not it's not always easy. Yes. Both of those funding sources, again, they approach, generally speaking, as a community corporations approach. Um, yes, philanthropy in, in a certain way. Restricted funds. Some of it's restricted. It's yeah. um, again, it, it's so in alignment with with their brand. So there's a yes. um, an important, and again, it's a it's a two way street. I don't pretend this is a huge burden on the mission continues, yes. but there's work on our end to make sure that we are elevating and recognizing the brands of our corporate partners as well. Yes. yes. Um, and then foundations who tend to be again as a community. It's not always true tend to be really focused on impact and long-term mm -hmm. outcomes. And that for a nonprofit of our age and size is w wonderful and we applaud it and can be very challenging. Um, mm -hmm. So all of it comes with its learning points and, and stewardship opportunities. And uh, I can't, I don't like one or, over the other. I, I would love, I, I hope the whole giving community will move more towards unrestricted gifts Mm -hmm. Because I have been running a nonprofit now during COVID, and there's there has been no more acute time for us to recognize the importance of us yes. being able to make smart decisions and be nimble as an organization when our business needs to shift, and that's been critical, you know. And it's really hard to do when you're when your funding is restricted. Mary Beth, it was an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. And uh, thank you so much for joining the Mission Business Podcast. Thank you, Jen, for all that you all do. And um, it was such a pleasure to be on here today and, and talk about both of our stories a little yes, bit and yeah. hear more about yours as well. So um, thank you so much. That was my conversation with Mary Beth Brueggemann, president of The Mission Continues. To learn more about Mary Beth and The Mission Continues, visit themissioncontinues.org. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Mission Business Podcast. We look forward to bringing you more stories of innovation and perseverance from nonprofits around the world. I want to thank the team at PWP Video for their guidance and assistance in the development and production of this podcast. They are a great partner for Media with a Mission, and you can find them at pwpvideo.com. Additional information about this episode can be found at missionbusinesspod.com. And follow us on social media at Mission Business Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I want to thank our guest for this episode, Mary Beth Brueggemann, president of The Mission Continues. This podcast was produced by Erica Blair and Geraldine Dressler of Your Part-Time Controller, LLC. Dave Winston and Michael Schweizheimer are the producers from PWP Video. And the show was directed and edited by Pat Ganley. Again, I'm Jennifer Oliva, and we'll see you here next time on the Mission Business Podcast, presented by your part-time controller, LLC.